Hello, my name is Ricky Berger with the Wood Avenue Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama. I'd like to thank you for joining us for our Bible study today. If you're not a regular member at Wood Avenue, we certainly would extend an invitation to you to join us at any opportunity that you might have, whether it's on our Facebook page or our YouTube page or in person if you ever have the opportunity and you're in Florence, Alabama. We, again, would encourage you to study the Bible every opportunity that you have and study daily. If you would ever like to reach out to us, please visit our website at woodavenuechurchofchrist.com. We'd be happy to get to know you and to study the Bible together with you. To our members, we would remind you to encourage one another and be encouraged. Uh, certainly times are different right now and what we're able to do, but we're pushing through. Please study your Bible every day, pray diligently every day, and check on one another. Make sure everyone is, is doing well as we as a church family seek to continue to make it through this pandemic. Look forward to a time when we can all be back together and see one another in person. Our Bible study today is from the book of Matthew chapter 19. If you'd like to go ahead and open your Bible to Matthew chapter 19, and verse 16. We're going to talk today about a man that you would love to have as a neighbor, oh, but you would not like to be this man. A man that you would, you couldn't think of a better neighbor to have, but you really don't want to be this man. Yes, he's a rich young ruler. From the beginning, we're reminded of the importance of studying all of the Bible. The gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John so have similar accounts, sometimes the same account, sometimes different accounts. Sometimes they tell us the same account, but each give us a little bit of different information. For example, in the story of the rich young ruler, you cannot read just Matthew or the other accounts to know that he was rich, young, and a ruler. You have to read all the accounts. One will tell us he was rich, another will tell us that he was young, and yet another will tell us that he is a ruler. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, the Bible says, Behold, one came and said to Jesus, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? From the beginning, we see that this is a man that would pique our interest because he is concerned about eternal life. Sadly, many people in this world today and even in the world when Jesus was walking amongst men are not and were not interested in eternal life. But that does not mean nobody is interested in eternal life. There are still many throughout this world who do ponder the question, what about eternal life? We're thankful for those who seek answers to this question. And here was one who was seeking an answer. Notice the effort that he put forth. He went to Jesus. Have you put forth effort like this rich young ruler lately? Have you went to the Word of God, the Bible that tells us about Jesus, so you might know what you can do to have eternal life? That's where it begins. I must go to the right place. I must look to the Bible. I must search the Scriptures daily. And I must look and seek the answers for the questions that I have. And this, the greatest question one could ever ask, what shall I do to have eternal life? That's our introduction to this young ruler who was a very wealthy man, but yet seeking out God, wanting to know the answer to life's greatest question. Do you know that answer? Do you study the Bible and looking for that answer? We would encourage you to do so. Jesus' response is one that can be confusing if we allow it to be confusing, and some want it to be confusing, because Jesus would say to him in verse 17, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Here some would say that Jesus is not God. He is, he is rejecting this man and saying only God is good. But that's not the case at all. Jesus is simply stating that he is God. If you're going to recognize me as good and only one is good, and that is God, and you're coming to me for eternal life. He's simply confirming what this man has come to ask, that yes, I am God. 
and you can come to me to seek eternal life. Jesus is not living amongst us today. He is not here today for us to uh, walk up to him and speak to him directly. Oh, but he is still here. He's still alive. He is eternal. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. After his death, burial, and resurrection, he ascended back into heaven. There were those on that day that saw him ascend into heaven, and then angels told them that one day he will descend just the same. But we know in a study of the Bible that Jesus is at the right hand of God, where he is sitting and where he is in power and in control of his church and of his kingdom. And we do have his word today just the same as they had it then. They would walk with him and speak to him directly in that day and time. But we have the benefit of knowing what they said. Certainly not everything that was spoken, but what was needed for us to know so we too can have eternal life. It is the Bible. It is the inspired word of God, Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. So when we study the Bible, we are seeking eternal life from the God of eternal life. So this one would then ask Jesus, well, which commandments? Which commandments do you want me to keep? Jesus would say to him, you shall not murder in verse 18. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Continuing on into verse 19, he says, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These words seem familiar to us, do they not? Well, they should. They're familiar words to anyone who's ever had any uh, time in the Bible or Bible lessons or in a Bible class. They're some of what we refer to as the Ten Commandments. Given by Moses the great lawgiver, John chapter 1 and verse 17. But they were given in the book of Exodus. We see that God had given many commandments to the children of Israel, not just ten, but these were the ones that Moses would return and having them written on the tablets of stone to deliver to the people of Israel after their exodus from Egypt when they were still in the wilderness wandering. We realize that today we are not under the Old Testament, for the Bible would clearly teach this in the book of Hebrews as well as other books in the New Testament. However, we are still to obey God, and we find that these commands appear in the New Testament, all except that of keeping the Sabbath day. Today, our day to come together and worship is on the first day of the week, the day that our Lord was resurrected, as we see in the beginning verse of the last books of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And we see that the church began on the Pentecost day, in Acts chapter 2, which was the first day of the week. And we see that Christians were worshiping on the first day of the week in Acts chapter 20 and verses 6 and 7. Jesus, when he lived, it was still the Jewish period of time. This young ruler, when he was living, it was still the Jewish period of time. And Jesus refers back to these commandments as we refer to them as the Ten Commandments and telling him to not murder, to not commit adultery, to not steal, to not bear false witness, to honor your father and your mother, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But notice the answer given by this young man in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 20. He said to Jesus, all these things I have kept from my youth. Now, how old was he? I do not know. But he was a young man, the Bible says, and he had kept these commandments from his youth. That tells me that no doubt he was influenced by the right people. Certainly his parents, his family, maybe older siblings, the Bible does not say, but those that he was around. He was influenced by the right people. For from a youth he had kept these commandments to obey God and to follow God. From his admission, he is someone that you would want to be around. And Jesus did not contradict him at this point. Jesus did not contradict him and calling him a murderer or an adulterer or someone who is uh, a thief or someone who is a liar or not honoring his parents or uh, loving or not loving his neighbors. This is, Jesus never never said anything to contradict, assuming that 
this young man is saying all of this in his good conscience. Now, he has really kept this from his youth, and Jesus gives us no reason to believe otherwise. So he would say, I've kept all this from my youth. That's why I'd say there's a man that you want to be around. You want him to be your co-worker. You, you want a co-worker who's not going to lie to you or steal from you or try to harm you. You want him as your employee. If you own a business, this is the man that you want to hire. Someone who's going to be honest. Someone who's going to help your business rather than hurt your business. If you are an employee, you want to work for someone like this. And you want this to be your neighbor. You want to share a landline with someone like this. Someone who's not going to cause harm to your property or to your home. You want someone that you know that you can trust. Isn't it nice to have good neighbors? The Lord has blessed me with great neighbors throughout life. I suppose in every home that I've lived in up to this point, I have had great neighbors. I've had those that I could depend on and who were very, very friendly to me. I really never thought about it until this very moment. I've known that I've had really, really good neighbors, but I haven't really thought of the greatness of them and what a wonderful, wonderful blessing that has this has been to me and in my lifetime to have such good neighbors. So we, in our lesson text of Matthew chapter 19 and verse 20, notice that this is a young man that from his youth had kept these commandments. We see that he was a, a good person to be around. But you remember I titled the lesson, the uh, the neighbor that you would want to have, but not the man that you would want to be. For this rich young ruler would continue in his discussion with Jesus and ask the question, but what do I lack? If I'm not a murderer and I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a thief, I'm not a liar, I'm honoring my family, I'm honoring my neighbors, I'm loving my neighbors as myself. Lord, what, what else is there? What do I lack? Jesus gets to the heart of this man's problem. If you want to be perfect, if, it's to say if you want to be complete, go and sell what you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Notice Jesus does not condemn this man for being wealthy. He does not condemn him for, for being rich. But he tells him to go and sell what he has and give to the poor. There's where his treasure will be. Matthew chapter 6 would teach us, our Lord himself in his Sermon on the Mount, that you cannot serve God and mammon. You, you cannot serve God and money. Many people try to serve money over God, and there are those who try to serve God and money, but we must serve God. Notice Jesus isn't condemning him for being rich, and he's not telling him that he has to be poor. He's just simply telling him to sell what he has and give to the poor. Find his treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Have you ever considered what if what if our Lord was going to bless him with greater riches than he had at that moment in time? Do you remember Job of old in the Old Testament? Job in the beginning verses of this book seemed to have it all. But how quickly he lost it all. But as you read the 42 chapters of the book of Job, you get to the end of the book and you see that he, he gained more in the end. The Lord had blessed him. You know the parable well of uh, the talents in Matthew chapter 25, the one talented man and the two talented man and the five talented man. For the man, the men with the two and the five talents, they were faithful with their talents and the Lord blessed them. Would bless them with even more. I, who, who's to say that the Lord wasn't going to test him? See if he would sell it all, give it all to the poor, and then bless him with even more because then he'd have the right attitude to continue to do more with it. Jesus just simply said, sell it to the poor. Sell what you have. Give it to the poor. Notice he didn't say sell it to the poor, but he said sell it and then give to the poor. Give the proceeds to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. The greatest treasure that you could have is your treasure in heaven. Jesus paid the way with the greatest price ever, his blood. Upon doing so, he established his church, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. We think about the joy of heaven. It's already been purchased. 
we just simply must obey. We must obey God and do everything that God says if we want to go. Jesus said, come and follow me. You must make a decision to follow God, just like this young ruler. He had a decision to make, but sadly, sadly, he made the wrong decision. In verse 22 of Matthew chapter 19, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I want you to think with me for just a minute. What do you think would be easier? To sell your possessions or not murder? Well, most of us would say it would be really easy to not murder. I don't want to murder anyone. Or commit adultery. Say, well, it'd be, it'd be really easy to not commit adultery. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Some, it might be a little more difficult to say, well, I, I'd have a little more difficulty with selling my possessions than stealing because sometimes I take what's what's not mine. And then maybe for, for even a, a greater majority of us, it would be easier to say, well, it would, um, it would be easier to, to not bear false witness than sell my possessions. I would rather I'd rather bear false witness. Maybe I'd, I'd I'd rather change the truth just a little. Maybe I would tell just a lie, just a little lie, but I, it'd be easier. I find it easier to do that than to sell my possessions. What about honoring your father and your mother, which would be easier for some? Sadly, they would say it would, it, it would be easier for me to dishonor my parents than to sell my possessions. I would I would choose that route. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, you you don't know the neighbors I have. You don't understand. I, it's, it's a challenge with the company around me. I'm not going to love them as myself, so I'm going to choose to not obey that. Here was a young man that said he has not committed any of these offenses against God. Not murdering or adultery or stealing or bearing false witness. He was honoring his parents. He was loving his neighbors as himself. But for him, the greatest hurdle to overcome, the greatest difficulty that, that he faced, the greatest challenge that he faced was that of selling what does not belong to him. Jesus said, go, sell what you have and give to the poor. R really, it's, it's, it's not his. Everything belongs to God. God has simply given it to him and placed it in his possession for a period of time. He's not going to take it with him. He's not going to take it to his next life. So why such an attachment to it in this life? Jesus said, you know, treasure in heaven, that which is most important, the treasure that you can have in heaven. Just sell this and find your treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. No doubt Jesus knew that this treasure on earth, the possessions he had, was possessing him. You must... Ask yourself, do you possess your possessions or do your possessions possess you? Do you serve the one who has blessed you with your blessings or do you serve your blessings? And if we're not serving God, then we need to take a serious look. We need to do that self-examination. We need to step back and even get away from it if it should call for it. And understand that it's more important to serve God rather than to go away sorrowful. This young man, he heard the saying, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. As far as we know, he never returned to the Lord. How sad is it? Do you think some 2,000 years later that these possessions that this man had at that day and time mean anything to him now? Do you think they meant anything to him yesterday or the day before, or the year before, or the century before? Certainly not. Possessions, however much or little, we may think that we have. They are ours for a limited time. And then they go off to someone else. This young man goes away sorrowful, for he had great possessions, but one day he took that final breath. And all of those possessions were possessed by someone else. No doubt they were probably scattered among family and friends, but they were all given to other people. This man went away sorrowful. He could have went away happy. He could have went with Jesus, found treasure in heaven, followed Jesus, and understood what the great treasures of life was about. And he could have blessed others along the way. He could have 
perhaps bless those that he sold them to, maybe people who were in need, but certainly the poor, the poor who could not have these possessions. He could have blessed them and helped them and maybe said, hey, I found something greater. I'm going to, 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 to bless you with, uh, with, with what I have after selling my goods, but I want to bless you even more. I want to tell you about a greater treasure that I found, a treasure in heaven. Oh, the man that you would want as a neighbor, a good man, a moral man. He's going to love you as himself. He's going to honor his family. He's, he's not going to steal anything from you. You don't even have to lock your door if he's your neighbor. You want him as a co-worker. You want him as a, as a friend. You, you want him as an employee or as an employer. He's a good moral man. He's, he's someone that would be good. Uh, in society and help society. But he's not the person you want to be because he went away sorrowful rather than serving God. You must ask these two great questions. What must I do for eternal life? I hope you'll ask that question. I hope you'll use the Bible to answer that question. And again, I would extend the invitation if if you would be willing to allow us to study with you, please reach out to us at the Wood Avenue Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama. We'll be happy to study the Bible with you and help you to see what the Bible says you must do to have eternal life. But you must ask yourself the question also, how will I go away? Am I going away with the Lord? Am I going away rejoicing? Am I going with Him, seeking the treasures of heaven? Well, I go away sorrowful because something is keeping me from God. There's something that I'm not willing to give up. It may, it may be possessions. It may not be. It might be someone else or something else. It may be some sin that you're not willing to give up. I don't, I don't know what it would be, but nothing is worth it. There's not anything in this world worth going away sorrowful. Go with God. Serve God faithfully. Again, we thank you for studying with us. We would encourage you to join us at any and every opportunity that you might have as we look to the Bible together, as we seek to simply be servants of God at the Wood Avenue Church of Christ. Thank you.